When fisherman Salvador Alvarenga offered 22-year-old Ezekiel to join him out at sea, the guy thought it was a decent way to make 50 bucks. But in just two days, he was bawling and desperately clinging to the tiny boat tossed around by stormy waves heading out into the open ocean. Ezekiel wondered if he could hold on and survive the storm. Would anyone save them? And if so, when? What could be their last refuge in the middle of the ocean? As always, viewer discretion is advised. Did you know the legendary Robinson Crusoe story is based on real events? Actually, it's not even the most impressive tale of ocean survival. Decades after the real-life Robinson's rescue on the other side of the planet, a French frigate set sail from Madagascar to Mauritius. On board, there were 142 crew members and 160 Malagasy locals destined to be sold into slavery despite the prohibition of the slave trade. However, the French navigators miscalculated and the ship hit reefs near Tromelin, then known as the Isle of Sand. A tiny piece of land 1,700 meters long and 700 meters wide, rising just 7 meters above sea level. Constant waves tortured the island, leaving only shrubs, birds, and turtles. Now, 122 French and 60 Malagasy survivors had to coexist on this territory. They gathered wreckage, wood, and anything useful on the shore. Later, they embarked on a journey to the wrecked frigate to salvage everything possible. All 182 people ended up with a few barrels of alcohol, bags of flour, beef, and fat. But firstly, the French didn't want to share supplies with the Malagasy. And secondly, they lacked a crucial resource, drinkable water. To make it worse, the ship's captain went mad right after the accident. And without a leader, discipline faltered. On the third day, soldiers sentenced two sailors to execution for stealing supplies. One jumped into the ocean and the other was miraculously saved when they discovered water on the island. At a depth of four and a half meters, a brackish liquid barely suitable for drinking appeared in a makeshift well. Afterward, it was the assistant captain, Bartholomew Castellan, who took charge and things began to stabilize. People built tents, lit fires, hunted turtles and birds. However, the French wanted to go home, so they started building a ship from the frigate's debris. Castellan worked tirelessly almost collapsing, but the Malagasy helped him. Less than two months later, all 122 French sailors sailed away from Tromelin on a new boat named Providence, leaving behind the Malagasy. However, Castellan promised to return for them, and they waited for a long 15 years. Providence docked at Madagascar's shores in four days, yet the local authorities didn't heed the French's plea to rescue the Malagasy. France was at war, and every ship was precious. Although Castellan didn't forget his promise, it took 11 more years for the first rescue ship to set sail to the Isle of Sand. Still, it couldn't even approach the land due to dangerous reefs. The second attempt also failed. And it wasn't until 15 years later that the French finally reached the abandoned Malagasy on the island. There were only eight women and an eight-year-old kid. The Malagasy community kept the fire alive this whole time and managed a little farm. They say only 15 people were left alive after those years. They were building shelters from stones, fixing copper utensils, and crafting their stuff from shiplet. They even made jewelry and combs, trying to live rather than just survive. A lookout point on the island's edge showed they were still waiting for Castellan's promised rescue. But no matter how grim it seemed for the Malagasy, they at least had a chunk of land at their last refuge in the ocean. It could have been worse. A guy named Stephen Callahan experienced that firsthand. In 1981, he embarked on a solo journey across the Atlantic. He even named his boat Napoleon Solo. Callahan set sail from Newport to Bermuda, then to the Caribbean's Antigua. There, he got hit by a heavy storm that damaged the ship. Stephen quickly patched it up and sailed on to Madeira and the Canary Islands. By January of 1982, he took the return route. However, a week after setting sail, disaster struck. Something hit the Napoleon Solo, piercing its hull. Stephen thought it was a whale, but it didn't matter because the ship began to sink. He barely tossed an inflatable rubber dinghy overboard before the Napoleon Solo was underwater. Callahan dove into the sinking boat several times, blindly grabbing modest food and water supplies, a sleeping bag, navigation charts, a harpoon, signal flares, and three distillers for making drinking water. Shocked, Stephen realized he was in a part of the ocean where no ships roamed. 
about 1,290 kilometers from the nearest land. Callahan figured the wind would carry his raft in the right direction, toward shipping lanes. Yet even in the best conditions, it would take him two weeks to reach there, while he had supplies for only one. Stephen understood his fate was in his own hands. He unfolded one of the water distillers and within a half an hour took the first giant gulp. He recoiled. The water was salty and undrinkable. That's when he realized he didn't know how the distiller even worked. For a whole week, Stephen futilely tried to figure it out until he ran out of water. Thirst became unbearable, and in a panic, Stephen decided to cut open one of the distillers, hoping to understand how it worked. So, as he set up the next device, he knew this time he'd either get water or die of thirst. Indeed, he managed to get the life-saving liquid. It was literally a spoonful, but now he knew how to get it at least. Stephen didn't get to enjoy his victory for long though, as a new problem arose, hunger. For several days, he ate nothing until he suddenly spotted a fish on the surface. Callahan grabbed the harpoon and started fishing. A day passed, then another, and there was still no catch. Only on the 14th day of ocean wandering did the guy finally catch his first fish, giving him a chance at survival. The next evening, Callahan noticed a light on the horizon and realized it was a ship approaching. The relieved guy fired a signal flare and waved it with all his might, thinking his ordeal was finally over. Yet the ship silently went its way, and no one noticed the poor guy lost in the middle of the ocean. After four weeks adrift, Stephen was totally down in the dumps, crying and whining about his fate. When the will to live finally kicked in, Callahan crafted a makeshift sextant from pencils. You know, sailors used that ancient tool to figure out where they were at sea. However, the ocean had some new trials in store for Stephen. On the 43rd day of his ordeal, he aimed for another fish, but the catch tore the harpoon from his makeshift gun and poked a massive hole in Stephen's inflatable raft. Callahan freaked out, blindly searching for the leak, realizing he was sinking in the middle of the ocean. Eventually, he managed to clamp the hole with his hands, yet he couldn't keep it up forever. Plus, sharks were starting to gather around. Over time, Stephen figured out the raft wasn't sinking too fast, so he rigged up a manual pump to the hole. For several days straight, the guy kept inflating the raft despite his muscles burning like fire. And though Callahan eventually patched up the hole, his trials didn't end there. He endured storms, suffered constant thirst and hunger, and was slowly losing his mind in complete isolation. After 66 days, his last distiller gave out. So, Stephen started contemplating that this might be the end. And it was. 76 days in, the ocean drift washed the man ashore near Guadalupe. Local fishermen spotted him. By that time, Callahan had lost 18 kilograms. His body was covered in sores from the constant sun and salty water. Still, he was alive. Moreover, after recovering, Stephen Callahan summed up his harrowing survival experience in a book that stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for over 36 weeks. But wait, there's more. Callahan got invited to be a consultant for the movie Life of Pi. Stephen helped recreate the real atmosphere and crafted props for the film. Later on, he developed and patented an improved life raft design, which became his refuge in the ocean for a month and a half. Can you even imagine anything more terrifying? Unfortunately, it's not a rhetorical question because the answer is yes. There are more horrifying stories than this one. 40 years before this, a Chinese guy named Poon Lim served on the British ship Ben Lamond, transporting foodstuff from Cape Town to New York during World War II. On November 23rd, the vessel was a few hundred miles east of Brazil when a German submarine attacked. Ben Lamond exploded, tilting heavily, and tossed Poon Lim overboard when he surfaced, only debris remained. Ben Lamond sank in less than two minutes. Poon Lim got really lucky, grabbing onto a piece of board and holding onto it for the next two hours. The guy was terrified because despite working at sea, he was a lousy swimmer. And desperate cries from other crew members echoed around. He wanted to help them, but didn't even know how to save himself. Suddenly, the sailor spotted a wooden raft nearby and swam to it. Surprisingly, it was remarkably well equipped. On a two and a half meter raft, there was this shelter thingy, together with a big water canister and hefty food supplies. 
Poon Lim also had a signal and smoke rockets, a knife, a whistle, and a flashlight. Seems like he wasn't in the worst spot, right? Well, the dude didn't have a compass or a map and didn't know where he was or where the current was taking him. And to top it off, there was a war going on in those waters. No one's gonna rush to help him. Poon Lim had a decent stash, yet he knew it wouldn't last forever. So the sailor got to work right away. He fashioned a rough fishing hook from a nail, attached it to a string, and used bits of fabric from his clothes as bait. Time passed and the fishing wasn't really paying off, until on the fourth day, he finally caught something. Although Poon Lim had a knife to process it, he had to eat the meat raw. It grossed him out, but he forced himself to get over it because, hey, that might be his only meal for days. Only later on did the sailor learn to sun-dry fish, eventually figuring out how to catch seabirds, salt them in seawater, and dry them as well. He also collected rainwater from his shelter, but both the water and the fish catch weren't a daily thing. Weeks went by, and Poon Lim started suffering from unbearable thirst. With nowhere to get water, the guy was falling into despair. Then he saw sharks circling the raft, and a crazy idea struck him. Usually, he'd scare off predators with a whistle or fend them off with a knife. This time, however, he wrapped his hands with a tarp, took a caught seagull as bait, and dipped it in the water. When a shark came close enough, Poon Lim grabbed it, wrapped it with a rope, and hauled it onto the raft. However, the predator wasn't giving up and tried to attack the guy. So he smacked it with the water canister, cut out its liver, and drank the blood. It was a horrific ordeal, yet it helped Poon Lim satisfy his thirst. Weeks turned into months. When the guy spotted an allied submarine on the horizon, he nearly cried for help. However, all he got was laughter from the sailors. Poon Lim spoke English and desperately tried to explain his situation, but they just waved him off. Maybe the allies thought it was an enemy trap. Regardless, they didn't help Poon Lim this time or the next few times. Frustrated and devastated, the guy was in despair. He saw people, they saw him, and no one wanted to lend a hand. After over three months adrift, Poon Lim was suffering terribly from sores due to sun and salty water. Desperation and hallucinations were getting to him. He tried to lift his spirits by singing, praying, and talking to himself. He'd already given up hope for help when on April 5th, 1943, after 130 days in the open sea, fishermen finally spotted him. Poon Lim was practically naked, just wearing a makeshift skirt from a bag. He showed them his preserved British sailor badge, and they finally rescued him. Doctors diagnosed him with malnutrition, dehydration, anemia, skin infections, and muscle atrophy. In the first few days, he could hardly talk or eat. Still, Poon Lim managed to fully recover. He even received the Order of the British Empire for bravery and returned to serve in the merchant fleet. Eventually, Poon Lim moved to the USA and lived to the age of 72. One day, he found out he had set a Guinness World Record for the longest survival at sea on a raft. But the sailor only said, may no one ever have to beat that. And indeed, no one did. Only because a raft isn't the only thing you can drift on in the ocean. On November 17, 2012, fisherman Cose Salvador Alvarenga went to sea with his inexperienced assistant, Ezekiel Cordoba. They never worked together before, but Salvador urgently needed a replacement for his usual partner. Cordoba was up for a 30-hour shift and 50 bucks. So these fishermen set out from the Mexican town of Costa Azul, near the coast of Chiapas, on a small single-engine boat. They snagged almost 500 kilograms of fish and headed back to shore. But on the return trip, a fierce storm kicked in. Massive waves were swamping the deck, threatening to sink or flip the boat. Cordoba was constantly bailing out water, and Salvador skillfully steered, trying to get them back to land. Unfortunately, just when the coastline appeared in sight, their lone engine gave up. A panicking Cordoba started sobbing, and Salvador called the boss for help. It turns out the fishermen didn't have an anchor, the GPS wasn't working, and they didn't even have navigation lights. Their boat was an invisible speck in the stormy ocean, and no one could assist them. The weather went so haywire that all vessels were banned from going to sea. Meanwhile, the nasty rolling nearly tossed the fishermen overboard. Despite everything, Alvarenga tied buoys to the boat for stability 
and made his partner keep bailing water hour after hour, non-stop. Eventually, they got so frozen they couldn't work anymore. So the fishermen flipped the freezer upside down, crawled inside, and huddled together. And the storm didn't let up for a whopping five days. During this time, the boat with the fishermen began drifting into the open ocean, and all rescue attempts were unsuccessful. When the storm finally calmed, Salvador and Ezekiel realized their situation. They lost almost all their gear and had meager food supplies. Nonetheless, Alvarenga quickly found and mastered an incredible strategy for catching fish. He'd plunge his hands into the water, up to his shoulders, pressing against the boat and wait for fish to swim between his palms. Then he'd grab the catch, pressing into it with his nails. The man sun-dried the meat or ate it raw. They had no water at all, so after a few days in the open ocean, Alvarenga started drinking his own urine. Despite all this, thirst and hunger became unbearable. Salvador gnawed on his own nails and swallowed jellyfish, but it didn't help. Cordoba tried to copy his partner, but the ordeal was much harder for him. Fate smiled upon them only after two horrendous weeks, and it started raining. They laughed and rejoiced, like kids, catching raindrops with their mouths. Unfortunately, that was just one pleasant moment amid the horrific weeks at sea. Over time, the fishermen began noticing and collecting debris. They kept all plastic bottles to gather water during rain. And once, they found a real treasure, half a cabbage, a few carrots, and a bit of semi-soured milk. However, most of the time, they had to survive on fish, sea turtles, and birds. At some point, it became unbearable for Cordoba, and he outright refused to eat. Later on, Ezekiel died. But Alvarenga couldn't accept the fact that he was all alone, so he spent a few more days talking to his deceased partner. The fisherman promised to visit the young man's mother if he ever survived. Alvarenga found solace in his own imagination, where he walked, ate, and made love to his heart's content. And that's how it went month after month. Sometimes, he'd spot ships on the horizon and spend hours jumping and waving his arms, but no one saw him in the middle of the ocean. Time and space practically ceased to exist for Salvador until he felt a strange push. He washed ashore. The exhausted man, in nothing but shredded underwear, literally crawled through the sand and bushes of a little island, when suddenly he saw a house. A man and a woman stared back at him in shock. Turns out the fisherman drifted for 438 days, covering around 10,800 kilometers to the Marshall Islands, one of the most remote corners of the planet. The story of Salvador Alvarenga instantly went global. But when he first appeared on camera, many couldn't believe this guy spent over a year in the open ocean. Though, in reality, Salvador had to recover physically and mentally for a long time. He found the strength to fulfill his promise and meet Ezekiel Cordoba's mother. It might seem like people who survive long ocean drifts eventually catch a break. They become famous, get awards, and write books. And maybe they manage to enjoy life after all but the price they paid for it is way too high. Would you be willing to go through such an experience just to make your book a bestseller?